Good afternoon, and welcome to week three of Montgomery County's Black History Month celebration. I struggled a little bit to come up with the best way to welcome you to today's program, considering that the theme for today's program is law enforcement, policing, community advocacy, and organizing. I wrote a poem uh, to express the depth of the pain that I experience upon reflecting upon the violence toward unarmed black men and women, a poem that ended with an expression of hope. I wrote a three minute speech about the fight for justice and humanity, and that ended up with an expression of hope, hope. Everything I wrote about kept coming back to hope. Martin Luther King wrote, we must accept finite disappointment but never lose infinite hope. And Dr. King spoke these words nearly two months before his assassination on April 4th, 1968. And they serve as a powerful rallying cry for hope in the face of obstacles and injustice today. During these tumultuous times, hope can seem elusive. Unsurprisingly, all the uncertainty and negative negativity leads to feelings of fear and hopelessness. Now, hope won't change the fact that fear-inducing headlines and stories will continue to fill, fill our news feeds, but hope can help change our reaction to them. Realistic hope can serve as an antidote to the inertia that can result from hopelessness. The quote that I read for you is a great reminder that defeats, setbacks, and disappointments only last for so long. You can keep your hope even through these times. And in fact, it's essential in overcoming them. During his lifetime, Dr. King experienced plenty of times that would have caused many to give up but he kept on with determination because he was able to keep hold of his hope and not let go. There are many ways to conceptualize hope. Hope can be viewed as life -sustaining, a life-sustaining force that is rooted in our relationship with the future. Hope can often be seen as being built on belief and faith and that trust that there is a life worth living in uncertain times. Hope is often described as the golden mean between euphoria and fear, where transcendence meets reason and caution meets passion. So along with a hope and a future full of hope, there's a belief that you have the power to change the future to make it better. So it's important to distinguish hope from optimism. Blind optimism creates complacency and a failure to take action. In con contrast, hope viewed against optimism. People who are optimistic imagine that everything will turn out in a positive way. And I often consider this point of view a little dangerous because oftentimes people who are just blindly optimistic have a notion that they don't have to bother, they don't have to act. In contrast, hope can be a catalyst for action and it motivates us towards specific goals contributing to an action-focused optimism. Hope supports realistic optimism, a necessary component of success. A hopeful person doesn't necessarily believe that everything will turn out perfectly. And a hopeful person understands that there may be obstacles to face, but they're open to changing the course where it's needed. They take responsibility for the path that they wanna see ahead. 
President Barack Obama, or former President Barack Obama, said that change will not come if we wait for some other person or if we wait for some other time. We are the ones we've been waiting for. We are the change that we seek. Hope reminds me that Blackness or the African-American experience is not all about struggle. It's about light, love, hope, perseverance, and joy. And that's my wish for all of us today. We will now be led in the invocation by Bishop McCray. Thank you. Good day to everyone. Most holy and precious God, we come before you as individuals of the society that you have created. We ask that you will give us wisdom, compassion, empathy, and sympathy in this dialogue this day. We thank you for all those throughout the history of our world that has contributed to making humanity better. And we pray, Lord God, as we celebrate the emphasis of this month on the contributing of people of color and of diversity throughout the world, give us wisdom throughout the year to realize, God, that we all are of the same humanity. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Thank you, uh, Donna, Donna Richmond, who is our diversity officer for those warm and encouraging words. Um, also, thank you to Bishop McCray, who um, I know you have a, a busy schedule, but I appreciate you being here with us today to celebrate this Black History Month. My name is Myla Hayes, and I am um, a Montgomery County employee, and I sit on the Black History Committee. Um, it is my honor to serve as your moderator today. Um, I also want to acknowledge a number of our uh, Montgomery County colleagues, um, as well as the community at large. Thank you for being here today. If you have not joined us um, before today, I just wanted to share that um, certainly that the Black History, the 2023 Black History um, Month um, theme and banner is Black Resistance. This, the theme itself, itself acknowledges the power of our history, but also offers an understanding of the past and how those experiences can shape our efforts today. In fact, historically, African Americans have been subjected to oppression and racial injustices. Those iniquities have ignited calls for justice. In our fight for justice and equality, African Americans have found liberation, strength, unity, resilience, hope, and yes, even joy through our trials. It looks like Myla is frozen. Um, so we're going to have her go out and come back in. In the meantime, we're going to ask um, Matthew McCray to lead us in the national, the Black National Anthem, please. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Matt McCray. Um, I am a Junior here at Newburgh College, and I will be singing the Black National Anthem. <clears throat> Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring, ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise, 
High as the listening skies, let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the presence has brought us. Facing the rising sun of our new day begun, let us march on till victory is won. God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, Thou who has brought us thus far on the way, let us, Thou who has by Thy might, let us into the light, keep us forever in the path we pray. Lease our feet, stray from the places, our God, where we meet Thee. Lease our hearts, drunk with the wine of the world, we forget Thee. Shadow beneath Thy hand, may we forever stand. True to our God, true to our native land. Thank you. Sorry for my residents outside screaming. <laughs> Walking out here. That that was beautiful, Matthew. I don't. I'm waiting to see. Um, I don't see that Mina has came back on. Um, oh, she's saying she can't get in. I don't understand. But we're going to um, move on while Mila is get trying to get in, and we are going to ask our. Deputy um, COO Barbara O'Malley to give some opening remarks. Thank you, Laura. I would like to thank the Black History Month Committee for all their work in putting this series together and for the opportunity to speak with all of you today. In reflecting on this week's theme, I'm reminded of Donna Richmond's statement that acknowledged the courage of the Black History Month Committee of not shying away from these difficult topics. I also appreciate that the Black History Month Committee always puts together programs to educate, enlighten, unite, and uplift others. But this is a difficult topic. And yet again, in the shadow of a murder of a Black man at the hands of police officers. I want to acknowledge that here in the county, as our peers and colleagues, we have sheriffs, correctional officers, detectives, probation officers, security staff, and others who are tasked with protecting us and our residents. They are dedicated and valiantly serve all of us and their communities at risk of personal harm. We saw that this year with our own sheriff staff, who in the course of their duties, one was shot and another was seriously injured in an explosion. I also reflect on the many police departments across the nation and the world that publicly issued statements who were also disgusted and ashamed by the murder of Tyree Nichols, and unfortunately, the list of so many others that have lost their lives that way. I want to thank those law enforcement officers who work and protect us, who do that justly, without regard to race or any other factors. However, we as a society ask them to operate in an unjust system. We ask them to deal with the ramifications of systemic racism, expecting that none of them will ever be tainted in that work. We heard this month about the importance of education, access to healthcare, equal and equitable opportunities for employment and advancement, 
equitable opportunity for housing, social services, and to engage and truly be part of a community. Yet when we as a society fail at these things, and when some very bad people in law enforcement do reprehensible and illegal things, we act shocked. We like to think that it is just a law enforcement problem. It is not. We all as a society accept these unjust systems and allow them to operate. We accept the incarceration rate in this country. We all accept that we have systems that put black men and women at higher risk for being unemployed, undereducated, bankrupt, ill, homeless, and in jail. Some will say, well, they are the ones doing the crimes without ever looking at the systems that have been put in place and reinforced over hundreds of years, without understanding the impact of black codes and Jim Crow laws, without acknowledging the difference in treatment of white executives who have stolen millions in Enron fraud, crypto fraud, Wall Street scams, versus Eric Garner, a black man who was strangled to death by police for selling individual cigarettes. Of the Tyree Nichols case, I've heard and read the sentiment, the officers were black, it's not a racial issue. That makes it worse that we have so devalued some black lives in this country that they are now meaningless to everyone. That we have repeatedly shown there is little or no consequence to beating a black man to death, especially if he has just been pulled over by police. It is even more shameful that those officers were black. Not that they or their actions were any worse than others that have done the same, but it shows that we have made the taking of a black life and the murder of a black man so easy to accept. I hope our dialogue today helps to open hearts and minds about how every single one of us has a role to play in supporting law enforcement. If we had the things we speak of, equitable access to care, to employment, to education, to opportunity, if we had those things, their jobs would not be as hard. And if we showed that there are consequences to the taking of a life of a black person, that there is equal value to black lives, then we would be showing everyone how we want people to be treated. That is our job. Our law enforcement community reflects us. Their actions reflect our priorities. And if these horrific acts continue, it is because not only do we tolerate it, but that is the expectation we have set. I want to again thank the Black History Month Committee for the opportunity to have these discussions and continue this work. And I look forward to hearing from our panel to learn more. Thank you all for being here today. Okay, I believe I believe Myla was back on. Myla, are you on? Okay, we're not hearing from her. She was back on. Okay. Um unexpected. So we're going we are going to hear from our panelists. I just have to get the questions. I wasn't ready prepared to do this because Myla was Myla was the one prepared to do to do this and she has all of the questions that we are asking of the panelists. So let me see if I can get but what, while I'm looking for that, I want to first um thank our panelists um Angie Holmes, who is the president of the NAACP, um, Nar Sam, we have Heather Lewis, and, and I'm sorry if I don't have your title, I know Angie, um, um, and Linda Fields, and we also have um, former police chief, I believe, um, Corporate Willie Richette from Narstown. And while we are waiting on Myla to get situated and get the questions together, could you each um, open up and just tell us a little about yourself and what you are doing concerning 
um, the situation or the black resistance. We're talking about black resistance. So can you just open up and just share with us a little bit more about you and um, the work that you're doing concerning our black community? Um, if you, you want us to go in the order you introduced us or? Yes, you can. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Angelique Hinton. Um, I am the president of the Narstown NAACP. I'm also an, an executive director of an organization I co-founded called PA Youth Vote. Um, and in both of those organizations, um, I spent a lot of time advocating um, on behalf of uh, the Black community, specifically in Narstown, but Montgomery County um, on a larger level. Um, really just trying to, when it comes to this issue in particular, um, there's a lot of, of work to be done. Um, and so um, actually spending time really trying to understand, you know, policing um, in Montgomery County um, is kind of independent. There's over 50, I'm not your exact number, but over 50 police departments, all of them operating independently um, with their own processes and their own um, oversight and, you know, accountability um, to their individual townships. And so the struggle continues um, you know, for my work really is trying to understand when we're trying to get to that space of really having um, accountability um, and, you know, being able to have um, transparency um, and data, um, trying to figure out how we can bring all of these police departments together, um, which ultimately, you know, um, roll into the county and really understand what's happening um, disaggregated by race. So, you know, how disproportionate is our representation in the justice system? You know, how disproportionate, you know, are we being overly charged? Things of that nature um, are what I spend a lot of time doing um, currently as the president um, of the NAACP. Also trying to ensure um, that there is accountability when these horrible incidents take place um, and police are doing things that, you know, are unjust. Um, I've had many experiences with police. There are some very great police. Um, there are some that have a lot of biases and need training. Um, and then there are some bad police. And so we need to make sure that the bad police are being held accountable um, so that, you know, the community can feel safe, um, you know, under their purview. And so I'll pass it over. I think Heather was next. Thank you, Angelique, and um, thank you all. Thank you to the um, Black History Month panel for inviting me um, here today. Um, thank you, Barbara, for those words. You know, I do this work daily, um, boots on the ground, in the courthouse, at the jails, talking with people that are directly impacted by the criminal justice system. And, and we, we have allies across the board. We have non-Black allies. We appreciate our non-Black allies because just like COVID, we're in this together. This issue affects us all. And, um, you know, in all communities. And and when Barbara was, you know, I was triggered. You know, Myla, you know, prepared me and said, you know, this, this topic is triggering. And I'm like, yeah, you know, I do this every day. But, you know, when you hear it from a different perspective, when you see it from a different perspective and you see the impact that it has on other people, it refreshes in, in my spirit, how powerful and, and traumatizing and violent, um, you know, racism and police brutality is, and it affects us all. People don't think that, oh, well, you know, that's not your, your loved one, it's not your family, um, but it affects us all. To witness, you know, a, a murder at the hands of police, you know, via video, is traumatizing that that trauma radiates through the entire community and that trauma radiates through that entire community and so um i thank you barbara for for sharing that and and so we we do a lot of talking um you know we're we're asking for a lot of things and we're talking about a lot of things but that has to now transcend into action you know, we're now starting to realize, you know, and, and I'm speaking, speaking culturally um, from a black perspective that we don't want to vote, our vote doesn't matter, that we don't want to serve on juries, that we don't, it's just a way to, you know, the system to kind of get us caught up and, and to police us, you know, in another manner. But if we're not serving on those juries, when they're saying that we're having a jury of those of our peers, 
that jury doesn't look like us. That jury is predominantly white. And so when they say that you're supposed to have a jury of your peers, we're not getting that. And so when we're not voting and we wanna vote out or vote in people that are speaking and doing what we want, if we don't vote, it doesn't happen. And so, you know, we, we have to trust the integrity of the system, of those people that are in power, those people that, you know, are Democratic and Republican committees. We have to trust the integrity of that system the same way that they want us to trust the integrity of our police force. And yes, there are bad police out there. Uh, our organization is not anti-police. I forgot to tell you that I'm the executive director of the Reuniting Family Bail Fund, the only nonprofit um, bail fund in Montgomery County that's freeing people from pretrial incarceration um, at MCCF, which is the Montgomery County Correctional Facility. Um, our most vulnerable population, those that are fighting um, or having a mental health crisis or fighting, are fighting um, uh, addiction disorders, things like that. So uh, we are not anti-police. We are not anti-system. We're not getting people off and things like that. We are trying to slow that system down that has systematically incarcerated our vulnerable people, poor people, and especially people of color. So I'll um, wrap it up and pass it to Ms. Linda Fields, who's also a pioneer in this work. I'm trying to get back on the screen. <laughs> Welcome everybody and thank you for being here today. Um, how do I start? I, I think Heather and Angie kind of summed up the work that we all do together and collectively. Um, I was just on a call today um, with the district attorney and um, I had uh, 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 what, what I call a task force of people that are concerned, very, very concerned about the conditions in this county as it pertains to black men and women and children. And my organization, well, there's several. I'm the chair of the YWCA Tri-County area. Uh, I am also the founder of the Montgomery County Democratic Black Caucus chapter, um, which is affiliated to the Pennsylvania Democratic Black Caucus. I'm also uh, one of eight that represents the state of Pennsylvania with the, the Democratic National Committee and uh, we get the opportunity to be representative of Pennsylvania, but also the entire United States. Um, my passion and what trick, you know, what, what causes me to do what I do, I have to take you guys back and I'll age myself. Back to Rodney King. I did not realize the trauma and how that incident affected me until I saw George Floyd. Um, and not to mention, um, it just brings back a whole list of incidents that I have witnessed and have been affected by, both by family as well as um, friends and, and, and family and relationships with other people and their children and family members that have been traumatized by bad policing. The police department is not bad. The police, they're like Angie said, they're good police. They're police that need to be developed and trained and, de and, and sensitized. And then we also have bad police. And, and what happens is the lack of oversight or even responsibility of the powers that be, whether it's um, in the office of commission or it's the office of the DA or the chief of police or the superintendents of schools. I mean, but it's also some of us, we have to take responsibility for the things that we know and be able to be strong enough and not afraid to report it. Um, my mission is to empower people with knowledge, understanding, and educate them both young and old on what we can do we often talk about what needs to be done, but, but my, um, my passion is to, for us to be educated on process, absolutely use integrity 
in process because for so many generations we have suffered the lack thereof. And, you know, the questions we will get to answer, but a lot of what the questions are asking um, about my experience with this topic is my, my, my brother was shot by the police and I had a friend I grew up with. We were standing on the corner in West Philadelphia, car drove by and blew his head off and the blood splattered on me. So there's a lot of things and a lot of trauma that we suffer that we don't even realize until we see it happen again. And what happens is, is that, you know, our lives have been always dangerous and, you know, mistaken identity. I mean, it's not just the bad people in, in our cities and counties, it's the bad police. They make mistakes and we understand that, but some of the things that happen are inexcusable. And they and a lot of them were never held accountable. And historically law, law enforcement has been dangerous, especially for our black men, young and old. And the inequities and harassment, intimidation and the brutality and the unjust imprisonment and lengthy sentencing comes from systemic racism. And we have to be educated. A lot of people are desensitized because it's been going on for so long and people are living in hopelessness and just saying well that's just how it is well i'm here to tell you no it is not we have a voice and we have an opportunity to continue as our um, diversity um, director said to have hope and that hope means that we have to come together we have to take the time to educate ourselves on process, follow the process. And sometimes it won't work for us, but the process is the process and integrity is everything to me. And, and if we can do that and we can fight against the injustices that have been imposed through policy and, and because of so many racist and systematic injustices that have been going on for generations, um, until we stand up and say no more, until we use our collective voices to make those changes. And that is what is happening with Heather. That is what's happening with Angie. That is what's happening with most of us on this call, both Black and non-Black. You know, Thank you, Linda. I do appreciate your comments. Let me extend a sincere apology. Um, we know that these things can happen, right? <laughs> when we're working um, virtually. Um, so I want to apologize for that. I was in the side of the office that doesn't have strong connection. Um, so I apologize um, for that. I wanna get us back on track, um, right? Our last introduction and very brief introduction is, um, we affectionately know him as Captain Rochette. Um, of course, but he'll just share really briefly what um, he has done. Um, and, and then we're gonna jump right into the question um, period. Captain Rochette, please. Take your mute off. Go down to the bottom and hit the mute button. Unmute yourself. How about I just kind of give a really brief introduction of Captain Rochette? Because again, we know, we all know Captain Rochette. Um, I know all of these panelists um, very personally, but I do know Captain Rochette who has served on the North Sound Police um, Force for over 40 years. Um, he served as Captain Rochette, who we, affect, we all affectionately know him as Captain Rochette. Um, and then he retired as um, a, um, the interim uh, chief of police. And then he then retired again as the deputy chief at Montgomery County Sheriff's Department. So we are so excited 
um, that he could join us. And I'm excited that all of these panelists could join us. Um, as I mentioned, I know all of these panelists really well, and I, I, I expect that we will have a really lively discussion um, but I want to walk you through some of these experiences um, today, and then um, I think um, you'll have an opportunity to ask questions um, in our chat or share any comments in our chat as well. So I'm going to pitch the first question to um, Angelique Hinton. Um, Miss, uh, Miss Hinton, and again, she did tell me I can say Angie, okay? So if we're getting a little impersonal, you all know, I know them all well, and she did share that I can call her Angie. Um, but the intro question um, is, what is your experience with Black resistance, particularly in the work within the NAACP? And how have you observed this topic's impact on the Black community? Break it down for us more clearly, and then we'll, we'll go into another uh, period of questioning. So for the NAACP, and, and mind you, I do this work in, in kind of two different ways, right? So with the NAACP, um, I spend a lot of time really trying to hold people accountable, really taking a look at, you know, um, you know the dis disproportionate representation that we have in the criminal justice system, really trying to hold, um, again, you know, um, like the district attorney's office accountable to one, providing transparency to the community because, um, you know, really right now we we don't even really know, uh, we don't have data to show us exactly what is happening and just how disproportionate it is. So really trying to work within, you know, um, you know the system to really challenge it, right? And and we need to see data, right? We want to see disaggregated by race and we want to see it disseminated to the community um, or to the people they represent you know, on a systematic basis. So we understand what's happening. So that's a big part of the work that I've been doing. Also really, again, trying to get to a place where we continue to have conversations with police chiefs across the county. There's over 50, right? To try to, how do we understand what's happening in each of those districts? Now I'm, I'm focused mostly on our area, but working with again, across the county, really trying to push that out and make sure there's some sort of uniformity to the reporting um, so that we really can digest um, what is happening. Now, from a, a resistance perspective, um, again, speaking back to what Heather was, was talking about, I spend a lot of time educating the community. And I do that in both Norristown as the NAACP president, but also in my organization, which is called PA Youth Vote, where I work with young high school students to really connect the dots for them between disproportionate representation in the criminal justice system and understanding that the district attorney has a lot of oversight over that, right? He sets the policies that will dictate whether or not we're gonna to continue to really try to hone in and make sure we're being more equal and equitable or not. And so helping them understand the importance of civic participation, right? Voting, we have to vote because elected officials our district attorney is an elected official. And so if our community is not voting, right, which oftentimes because of the disenfranchisement, we have become disenchanted and have, as Heather said, you know, kind of backed out of participating. However, elected officials pay very close attention to who is voting. And if we're not voting as a community, we get pushed to the back of the prioritization because we're not a threat to elected officials staying in power. And so the, the bulk of my work is spent really trying to connect the dots between this issue, right? And, and other issues and then connecting it to civic participation. So that's voting, but then also going to council meetings, going to commissioners meetings, the importance of holding leaders accountable. And then how to use your voice um, to do things. Like sometimes you have to show up and do a, you know, a, 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 a protest, right? Yes. Right. We need protest and policy. So that's what I spent a lot of time working on. Thank you. Thank you for that, Angie. Um, I know that the NAACP has been at the forefront of a number of the resistance efforts um, and certainly engaging our youth is what I heard from that comment, um, certainly to, to educate them, but also to get them involved in the process as well. Our next, I'm going to pitch that question to um, Ms. Heather Lewis next. And do you need to hear that again? 
that question again? I got it. Good. Most school I prepared. <laughs> awesome. But, um, and so in, in my intro, I explained some of the, the work that we do and, and listening to Angelique talk, um, you know, taking notes and just, you know, thinking that there, to break down systemic racism in, in all avenues, we're not just talking about policing and criminal justice work. We're also talking about education. We're talking about healthcare and the community organizing um, work and the model that we use is empowering directly impacted people. And so while the data is important, if we cannot trust the people that are giving us the data, then it's not worth the paper it's written on. And so we are in the courts. I'll give you for an example. Um, Carl, um, I can't think of his last name. I forgot it last night too. Um, he is the writer. He's in the courthouse every day. He's watching cases just like we are. His reporting is from a different perspective than what we actually see. We attended a trial last week. It was a homicide trial. And the process, it was supposed to be scheduled for five days. It started on Monday. They take a half a day to pick the jury and then they start the trial. All day Tuesday, I went on Wednesday morning. I arrived at 1030 thinking I'd be able to catch part of this trial. There's a sign on the door it said, do not enter. The judge is charging the jury. That means they were going to deliberate at starting at 1030 on Wednesday morning. The article, once they got the, the verdict on Friday, said that that was a three-day trial and that the jury deliberated for 10 hours. It wasn't a three-day trial. It was a day and a half of actual testimony and two days of deliberation on a first-degree homicide trial. So when we're talking about the data that they give us, it's skewed. If we're not there to see for ourselves, and that's the importance of voting. So, th so there's a process, there's lanes to doing this work. You have to trust the people that are giving you that information. And if we know that they're, they're, they're writing it in a way that doesn't make it look as bad, the incident that happened in Lower Marion a few weeks ago, if we did not have video documentation, if we did not know the people that were actually there and spoke to them, they'd be able to tell us a whole different narrative. And that's the process that's happening. So our organization is really pushing to be that trusted resource. We are in those spaces. We have eyewitnesses that are watching these trials that are in the courtrooms, that are in the public defender's office, that are in the probation and parole office, that are in the jails. We have people that are in all of those spaces that we can get actual <laughs> accurate information, not the information they want us to know. And so when you're talking about black resistance, that's what black re resistance looks like also. You know what I mean? So there's multiple lanes of addressing this issue and fighting this fight and breaking down the systemic racism because if we're just sitting here and waiting for the powers that be to tell us what they want us to know, then you know it's always gonna be that. And so um, Chanel, uh, the organization is the Reuniting Family Bail Fund. We're a nonprofit organization. Um, run by directly impacted people. None of us are attorneys. They're like, oh, are you guys attorneys? No, we've just been through the process. We And like Miss Linda said, we've seen this over and over and over again. And we are pushing back in a way that we are standing in the gap for folks. We are standing in the face of those folks that are giving us this data that makes them look good, like they're doing the right thing. Back to Lower Marion, you know, at Lower Marion happened. Then a few days later, we had a, another unarmed black man murdered by the police in, I, I think it was Missouri. He was tased to death. So we had the tasing in Lower Marion. Thankfully, she survived. We had a tasing a few days later. Unfortunately, that person, that man did not survive. And then a few days later, we had the murder of Tyree Nichols. And I was very anxious to say, hey, we have to do something. What better time, net the momentum, the time is now. Um, freedom fighting is not convenient. Protesting is not convenient. It's not based on the weather and, and if it's sunny or if it's gonna rain or if it's a holiday, like the urgency, there where's a sense of urgency. And, and you know, they were like, oh, well, let, let's wait. And it's like, 
it is happening over and over and over again like this just like they have their boots on our necks if we don't keep our boots on their necks nothing is going to change and so black resistance looks like a lot of things and we all those people in those lanes doing their job and staying on their job and 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 keeping it moving thank you thank you heather you said a mouthful um <laughs> <laughs> you, you certainly did. Um, and I do appreciate all of those comments. Excellent points. Um, I want to now pitch the question to Captain Rochette, um, again, who he will share his expertise from law enforcement and policing. Captain Rochette. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Give me the question again, will you please? Sure. Sorry. That's all right. I, I have um, a number of questions before me and all of the panelists received some of the questions. What is your experience with black resistance in your work within the police department or within policing? And how have you observed this topic's impact on the black community? Well, first of all, as you mentioned earlier, Myla, I'm retired, you know, I've been retired now for about 10 years now from the Norristown and then another eight years from the county. But I've stayed in, you know, pretty much in the, in the loop with the uh, things that are happening. But um, what had bothered me was uh, some of the departments, they would have this thing that they would say, well, it's not happening in our town. It's not happening in our township. So they don't look at it as a problem that they're having. But as some of the other panelists have said, this is a problem for everyone. It's not just in Norristown or it's not just in one particular community. One of the things that really, really bothered me was that it seems like, you know, these things are happening all over the all over the place, all over the country. You have one beat, one shooting here and then couple of months later is another killing, another shooting, a few months later is another. When is it going to stop? Uh, and unless we all get involved and stay involved and we, we you know, we can't, we can't uh, uh, put our heads down in the, in, the, in the sand and say that, you know, I, 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 it, it don't concern me. It concerns all of us. You know, I, one of the things that with me is that I had the opportunity to work in Norristown and live in, I still live here in Norristown. I bought my home here 45 years ago, and 47 years ago it was, and I still live here. I live right on Arch Street, like everybody knows me. And I've been a part of this town. Unless you, uh, uh, what we need is for our officers to take more, uh, uh, being more involved in the, in the community, take uh, ownership of your community. Be, you know, when, when, you, when, when, when things are happening, don't go home back to your, your your township and say, well, I'm not worried about what's going on over there. It's going to continue to go on if we don't, as police officers, you know, get involved and be a part of the solution instead of the problem. Thank you, Captain Rochette. Again, you said a lot of words as well. Um, excellent points. Um, but now I think um, I want to hear from Linda. I want to remind our panelists that you have two to three minutes to um, share your comments. Um, I know this is a passionate group. As I said, I know all of these people. Um, I know that they are trailblazers in the community. Um, they've done some great work um, and I know they have a lot to share, but we wanna make sure that everybody gets an opportunity to speak. Um, and as I say that, I wanna pitch the, the question to Linda Fields. Um, again, what is your experience with Black resistance? And I think, Linda, you shared some of that um, in your introduction um, in your work with community organizing. And, and how have you observed this topic's impact on the Black community? Linda? I apologize. Um, I believe that the work that we're currently doing and have continued to do for generations 
um, and that is educate, empower, engage, and then work towards eradication. Um, I believe that uh, we have been doing those things, but we have had a lot of roadblocks. We've had a lot of systematic um, stop bumps that we had to get around or over. And, um, but we, we continue to do it. And, and I, that is the wonderful and most hopeful thing um, that I see that the work that we are doing and continue to do makes that difference that in, in forces us to, to fight for the change that's needed. And so I believe that the work that I have done through the YWCA, through the Power Up Foundation, through the Power Up PAC, through the NAACP, and every other organization that I have partnered with and worked for. Um, I believe through the unions, um, everything, everything that we do is impactful and it chips away at the hard shell of discrimination, suppression, and oppression. So I believe that the work that we have done does work. We just, the results are slow to come and slow to see, but we have to continue that, that urgency and we have to keep it uh, in the forefront of our hearts and our minds and engage our young people and, and re-engage the people that have been disenfranchised and disillusioned because they haven't seen the results like they would like to have seen them, but we can never give up. Thank you so much, Linda. I do appreciate those comments. Um, I'm gonna walk us through or take us to some deeper um, questions. Um, and I think, Linda, you touched on a few of them. You mentioned, um, you did mention systemic racism, um, but I do wanna just touch on what do you see as the underlying factors um, of the problems we face. Um, why do you think resistance efforts are frequently science, uh, silenced, I'm sorry, by history? And again, Linda, I'm gonna pitch that question to you really quickly um, and then move on. It's a generational thing, you know, for years and years and years, it's been the way our system has operated. And it's because people want to hold on to their power their privilege and their money. And they don't wanna share, you know, the, the, the generational and systematic oppression is, 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 a, is, a, is a result of historical racism, the fear of loss of what they stole and historical privilege and greed. All of that is the fuel to continue to fight for what they call their own and it never really was. It was stolen from the people that actually did the work. You know, um, we have to realize that our power, we still own it. We still have it, no matter what we've experienced in our lives, the oppression, the suppression, the roadblocks that we face, we still hold the power as long as we have breath in our bodies. So what is what was the cause? History is the cause, the lack thereof of the truth we have the power to bring it forward and we must collectively use our voices to make sure that that happens. Thank you for sharing that. Um, what I hear is um, we, there is a legacy of bias, right? Yes. That has permeated every aspect of American um, life. Social, and so we, yes. exactly, exactly. So thank you for sharing that, Linda. Um, I'll pitch that same question. Um, if you have additional comments to add, because I think, you know, we all um, are going to, or all of you certainly can share that same comment or those same remarks. Um, but if you have something to add about what do you see, and this is to Angie, what do you see as the underlying factors of the problems we face and, and what do you think resistance efforts or why do you think resistance efforts are frequently silenced by history? Well, Linda mentioned truth, right? Truth seeking. And so, you know, when you look to the truth, it aims to like uncover, establish and publicize the truth about, you know, the history of abuses as well as personal experiences and consequences of the abuse. And so, you know, through Black history, 
we learn so much about ourselves and our abilities to overcome challenges. And so I think there is this concerted effort to try to silence that, right? Because again, people aren't really ready to address um, a lot of the, you know, ills, you know, the legacies of society built on this race-based um, system. Um, and so if we can just not tell the story, we can pretend some of it didn't happen, right? Mm -hmm. To those that were not oppressed. And for those that are oppressed, we can keep them from believing they can overcome a lot of these things. And so I think there's a lot of all of that that goes into trying to keep us from learning the truth. But I think, you know, it is our job to really try to make sure that part of our resistance is sharing our stories and, and really telling the truth about what has happened um, in this nation. Thank you for that, Angie. Captain Rochette, you're up. Oh, yeah. You know, there was said, some people said that Rosa Parks said that, you know, she uh, wouldn't give up her seat because she was tired. And we all know that that's not the truth. She didn't give up her seat because she was tired of the inequality. You know, there was that white privilege. And a lot of people saying that, you know, they don't see this inequality going on. Now, it's going on all around us, everywhere you go, everywhere you see. You know, there's been so many things that was trying, people try to do to, to not talk about the problem. But if you're afraid to talk about the problem, you're, you're, it's not going to be it's not going to be resolved. And we have to we have to we have to stop trying to fix it before we understand the problem. Mm -hmm. You can't you know if if you know what the problem is, fix it first. Some Thank of you. us we go through life you know and we don't we 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 just hide from the truth. We don't want to accept it because we don't want to be a part of it. Because if we say that it's not happening to me or it's not happening to my family, it's happening to everybody. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't want to get into uh, repeating everything because, you know, some of the some of the questions that we are, we, we our panel, we're probably going to be crossing over each other's questions, but I'll, I'll stop right there for now. So we the next question. Thank you, Captain Rochette. I appreciate that passionate comment. Um, uh, last but not least, um, Ms. Lewis, Heather. I will keep it short. Um, <laughs> we, we talked about transparency and accountability, and I think Ms. Linda touched on it a little bit, And because it's not only accountability and transparency for everyone else, because we're talking about you know Black folks today, but the accountability and transparency also lies with us. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? our own accountability. When we're talking about the, the same things that we talk about, how white people are comfortable in their privilege, they've stolen things. Black folks are comfortable in, in what they think that they've accomplished. They're trying to protect their own little world that, you know, that they seem or their bubble that they seem to have escaped racism and that that's not happening to me. Like Captain Rochette said, it's not happening to my loved one. But if you're living in a bubble, that you know, as a black person, and you're not recognizing the struggle of other black people, and you're saying, "Oh, well, they they chose to do this," and "Oh, and they're doing that," and you're not doing your part as a black person who has elevated or has had has um, increased their income, moved out the hood, and and all of that, and you're not looking back and seeing how can I elevate my other brothers and sisters that are still in the struggle, that are still fighting um, some of the the systems and and traps that have been laid for us as black folks to slow our strides, then you're part of the problem also. And so I'm right. not afraid to call out anyone who is standing in the way of equality for all people. It is not, you know, for you to be your brother's oppressor is not, you haven't arrived. And I'm gonna leave it at that. Thank you for that passionate remark. I'll go to the, the, the next question and um, I'll pitch this one to Linda Fields to start. How does reclaiming the history of resistance help social justice efforts today? Could you say that again? I sure. do, I'm looking at the question, but I, I sure. wanna, I wanna hear it. How this. does reclaiming the history of resistance help social justice efforts today? 
I believe that reclaiming um, the history of resistance comes with what we are doing right now. Mm -hmm. um, educating, engaging, and again, empowering our people to know what to do, when to do it, and how to do it. But they first have to educate themselves about how the process is working and it doesn't work. So we know what to do and what not to do. Um, I believe that um, we can continue to empower, but with a, a better strategy and it's called unification. I believe that we can again increase by using our voices and our votes to let everyone know the power is there. We are the car and we have the key. We just have to turn it on. Thank you. Captain Rochette. Yes. Again, how does reclaiming the history of resistance help social justice efforts today? Well, it, it keeps the fire burning. It keeps you on the front burner and not the back burner. You know, we we started, our forefathers started this, this, this journey for us a long, long time ago. And we have to, we have to now, we have to reclaim it. And we got to make sure that we keep, keep it going. We got to get get our young people, get our children, get, get our neighbors, get everybody involved in it to keep it going and not let that flame go out. Because if you're a boy, if, if you've ever been a Boy Scout, you know how hard it is to start a fire without a match, you know? And that's what we have to, we can't let the flame go. We, we've got something going now where we get more, more people, especially the young people are getting involved. And, and, and things that are happening now. They want to be, they're going out and they're getting out there and they're voting. They want to, they're getting out there and they're running for office now. And this is what we have, this is what we need. Keep that fire burning. Thank you. I like what you said, Captain Rochette. I'm reminded of um, one of the comments our uh, panelists said very early on, is it a movement or is it a moment? Um, and so yes, keeping that fire going. Um, is quite important. Um, Angie. So I'm, I'm happy I'm following um, Captain Rochette and he was talking about the youth and that is where I live most of my life right now. Um, and so taking that history and really making sure that our youth understand that we had to fight for so many of the things we have today and we have to continue to fight if we wanna make additional progress. So helping them understand again, how all of the issues that impact them are connected to policy, right? And so we have to make sure that we understand that people think, say all the time, I don't care about politics, but policy affects your life every single day. And so I spend all of my time helping them understand criminal justice, you know, policing reform, underfunded schools, all of those are policy decisions that we're making and helping them understand, you know, the importance of being civically engaged, voting, right? But then also we need to hold leaders accountable. I think that's a big component of what's not happening today. When you vote, you have the power to hold leaders accountable because they understand you will potentially vote for someone else if they don't, you know, if they're not responsive. So we teach them that. And then the importance of advocacy. Um, last year, we did a ton of work at the NAACP in support of the lawsuit that was, um, up, you know, against the uh, inequitable funding in Pennsylvania. I don't know how many people are aware um, that there is a severe underfunding in all of the black and brown schools across Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. It has to do with how the state legislature has determined that they would fund public education. So we're 47 in the country when it comes to investment in public education. And most of the black and brown schools are most directly impacted because the way they fund it is through property taxes. So we did a lot of work with our students to help them participate in advocacy work across the state. So they understand this is again, something that is it, you know, an issue that you vote on and we held leaders accountable. They wrote op-eds, they did press conferences. So there's all different lanes where we can get in and make change. As Heather mentioned, she's doing one thing you know, I'm doing my thing, but we all have to kind of be in the game. And I always say, get in your lane and be great there. 
Um, but but me for me, it's really um, educating, engaging, and empowering our youth to understand the importance of their vote and their voice. I hear you loud and clear, Angie. Um, engaging those youth are quite important, um, certainly because they will be the the future, right? Um, certainly. So I appreciate you sharing that. And I appreciate you, the work you do to engage um, those youth. Last but not least, Heather. Thank you, Myla. Um, so we're, we're talking about the historic nature of, of Black resistance. And when slavery was abolished, freed Black Americans created their own communities, their own economy, their own cities. They own buses, banks, clothing stores. They did everything they needed to do to be self-sustaining. Then, you know, we got integrated. And that integration meant that Black folks had to let go of their businesses or if they didn't let it go, it got burnt down, right? And so we have to come full circle again. And I talk about, like Ms. Linda said, about accountability and responsibility. We have to stop waiting for other people to do for us what we can do for ourselves. Ms. Angie is teaching that to these young people. Captain Rochette is teaching it to young people. Ms. Linda is teaching it to young people. But there are some old folks that just need a knock in the head to be like, look, you have to be responsible for your own well-being, right? Happiness is a choice. Your success is a choice. We cannot blame our failures, our trials, our, you know what I mean? What are on other people if you are not doing something daily to elevate yourself? And so while, you know, we don't want to be in that education space, we don't want to be working with youth because if we're working with youth, that means they're in the justice system. And we hate that. And believe, and Ms. Javon, um, is a trailblazer with working with youth justice and, and really getting that situation reformed and shining light on that because they're definitely shrouded in secrecy because they're wanting to protect the children. But that's a whole nother story. So what we've done um, as an organization is that we create platforms for folks. So we're dealing with very vulnerable people. Not only are you black, not only are you poor, but you also have a criminal background. And so that makes it extremely difficult for the folks that we're working with to be successful, to get housing, to get employment, things like that. So as a community of formerly incarcerated people, we're now creating a lanes for employment. We're creating lanes for housing. We're owning property so that we can put the formerly incarcerated people into those properties because we understand, we can we speak that language. We know what they're, where they're coming from and we can offer a little more grace to, versus you know the, the system that just is like, no, you're, um, you're a convict, you're this, you're that, and, and that's all you're gonna be. And I don't know what you expect them to be otherwise if that's all you label them to be. But um, so we, we create these opportunities where people can kind of rebuild their lives. And so we do touch on the youth and we try to, as far as the history, it's not um, associated with the criminal justice system, but it's about um, knowing our history. So we have a initiative called Not On The List. And the educators know that when it comes time for Black History Month and MLK Day, they get their list of people, about 20 people or so, that's the same 20 people that they give out every year for these young people to research for Black History Month. Well, Black Americans and Black Africans have done tremendous things in our history that is not tied to slavery. And so, or, the, or that resistance. And so the not on the list is challenging young people, K through 12, to research somebody that's not on the list. Write us an essay, send us some pictures. We'll post it on our social media, on our news, on our um, podcast and things like that. And we'll send them some swag and a gift card. And so that is expanding their knowledge. I don't, it could be your mama. It doesn't have to be somebody that is known you know, in the world. It has, has to be somebody that has impacted you and write about that person and share with us who they are. Black Africans, Black Americans, that's not on the list is, is our newest initiative to really help young people explore the vast excellence and brilliance and magical nature of Black folks. Thank you, Heather. So our next question, and, and we're gonna start um, wrapping it up and certainly um, if we have some time um, 
address some of the questions or comments um, in our chat. But our next question is, and this is, goes to Heather. Um, what is or why is joy an important, an important part of resistance? And I think this is really important um, because when we think about what resistance is, um, I think it was our diversity officer who mentioned that very early on that a number of the organizations didn't want to actually um, list their program under black resistance because resistance seems to be controversial. Um, but I think, you know, when we talk about what resistance is, um, we talk about um, the great migration, um, bus boycott, the Underground Rail Railroad, that wasn't controversial, that was indeed trying to find a better quality of living. Um, and so joy, and this is a, a new trend here um, that folks are talking about that joy indeed is resistance. Um, because even through all of the trials, even through the oppression, and even through the, the, the discrimination, we still can find joy. So again, Heather, why is joy an important part of resistance? Me out the way early. <laughs> but no, this, this is, um, that's probably um, the most therapeutic thing is finding the joy in the work that we do. Because what we do, the people that we work with, the families that we work with, are traumatized by the system. It, it's a violent system. It's it's just aggressive and and you know to watch DAs rip apart a defendant you know on the worst day of their life like they're not a human being is really really difficult. So in in the work that we do, joy or success or victories they all look different. Um, especially when we're looking at when we're saying saving people from incarceration. So if we save someone from a life sentence and they've got a a, a, a twenty five year sentence, that's joy. That means that's hope. That means that person, God willing, will someday come home to their family, will not spend the rest of their days behind bars, right? And so that's what joy looks like um, for us. That's why it's important to really, your perspective has to change. You know what I mean? You have to see the joy in some things. And, and one of the most incredible um, stories that I've come across um, with joy and, and making the best out of a situation is we have a family in New Orleans that has been doing this work. I would had the, the pleasure and, and surprising um, opportunity to train them to do some of the work that we're doing here. And she was fighting for her husband. Her husband was sentenced to 60 years. She fought for her husband. She got him home in 21 years. She had the wherewithal to video document the journey that her and her four kids at the time traveling back and forth to Angola State Correctional Facility in Louisiana. And she brought her husband home. She shot that, that video story around. Amazon picked it up. A year later, it was nominated for an Oscar. So they went from Angola prison to the red carpet. Now they have an Oscar nominated um, documentary. It's called Time. They just released the, the book that tells you all the things that they couldn't say in the documentary that was just released last week. And, you know, and, and she, a formerly incarcerated woman, we talked about voting and being elected officials. She is now running to be the state rep in the hottest city in New Orleans, you know, or the district, she has a Superdome, she has a French Quarter, she has Tremaine, she has all these things that are gonna be in her district as a formerly incarcerated black woman. I can't, I can't tell you enough how inspiring that is that you as a formerly incarcerated woman are now gonna be an elected official in one of the high, my favorite city anyway, in America. You know what I mean? And she's going to be doing that work in New Orleans. She's going to be saving people from that Angola prison, which is the one of the nastiest prisons in the country. Um, and so to have a leader like that in, a, in that powerful position is joy all day. Thank you, Heather. Um, it, it is always important, and I think, for us to hear the personal stories. So I do appreciate you sharing that personal story, um, definitely. Um, Angela, Angie, you're next. 
So for, for me, right, I have, this work is heavy that we're doing, right? Yeah. Um, and it, it pulls on you and there are days when you just feel defeated. Um, and so for me, I have made it, like my mantra this year is hashtag reclaiming black joy. People, people that know me know I say that all the time. Um, but what I do try to do is in doing this work is find those moments to celebrate, right? We I talked about the school funding lawsuit. Um, the lawsuit was, we won and we, the Pennsylvania was deemed unconstitutional and how they were funding our kids. So we were able to take that moment and show the young people that had participated in mm -hmm. rallies and press conferences that your voice really can create mm -hmm. change, right? And then, you know, in the work that I do, I said, I have the privilege and the pleasure of working with young people. And so it's also helping them understand, again, the power of their voice. So I'll take Zion, who came to us at a time when he was homeless and wouldn't get on a camera. He was so, you know, feeling so low. And so through working with us and building that sense of community, um, you know, little by little, we gave him a little bit more responsibility. Ultimately, he became one of our board members. Um, mm -hmm. And so last summer, we had him doing press conferences on behalf of the organization. So the first time he did it, he was so scared. He would barely, like, he was a very nervous person. Um, however, through us helping him wordsmith these statements, right, he, at the end of the summer last summer, did a press conference with the mayor of Philadelphia. And when I tell you he owned that room and all the reporters went right to him after he finished seeing that sense of mm -hmm. empowerment and confidence that we're growing and helping them understand there are all these different spaces and we need to fill all of them if we want to create change. Um, that's where I find my most joy. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that's where I think the work that I do is so extremely gratifying. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I'll pitch it to Captain Rochette and then uh, Miss Linda Fields. Um, we are um, a little after, uh, well, 115, a little over 115. And so we wanna get the opportunity to hear from the rest of the panelists before we end our program. So again, Captain Rochette, and yeah, well, well, you know, it's always good to talk about joy, <laughs> you know, and, you know, we're going to go through all kinds of, 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 of ups and downs and we're going to go through hardships, but we can't let that stop us from remembering what our forefathers, what our parents went through. You know, they said that in our church, we have, a, there's a saying that says, weeping may endure for the night, but joy, sweet joy comes in the morning. Mm -hmm. When you're going through that, through those times, when you, you can think back and you say, well, was it worth all of this? And when, you, when you're going through it and, you, and, and you, tears might be coming down your eyes, but mm -hmm. when you see the end results, that's what makes it so much better. That's when the joy of tears, the tears of joy come to you. That's what makes me happy when I know that I've done something, I've helped somebody who needed my help. I, I get compassionate about it, so I hope y'all can, you know, can understand this. Because even they tell me this in church, but I—that's the way I am. I get compassionate about when things that happen, and you get that joy, that sweet joy, and then you can enjoy the fruits of your labor. You know that it was not in vain, because you did something. You did something for somebody who couldn't help themselves. You put that flame back into that resistance, that joy. Thank you, Captain Rochette. That was very passionate. Um, and we, we, I'm sure some of, a lot of us can certainly relate to that. Um, when you're doing the work, um, at times it is difficult. Um, you all said that, um, but finding joy in some of those successes is really important, um, certainly. So last but not least, Linda Fields. Well, when you see progress, our hope is increased. And our joy is fueled to keep fighting. In the midst of all struggles. Yes. In the midst of all the things that we face in our current society today, political, economic conditions continue. We must continue to educate and strengthen and motivate, mobilize our voting base. This brings me joy. It brings me hope. It brings me strength to continue the fight. And Maya Angelou said, my wishes for you is joy. 
when you wish someone joy, you wish peace, love, prosperity, health, and happiness, and all good things. But lastly, I yeah. must say what my father told me, and I'm not talking about my earthly father who is now in heaven. I'm talking about my father who is in heaven, who is my strength, who is my creator, who is my motivator. My trust is in him and yeah. the joy of the Lord is my strength. And I hope it can be yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Linda. Now I have a final question and this will be really quick. Um, what gives you hope about the future, Captain Rochette? Really quick. Well, it gives, what gives me hope? Knowing that we're in this together and that we're, we're, gonna, get a, we're gonna get a solution to end all of the, inequ the inequalities that's facing our people today. Thank you. Linda, really quickly. In four words, each one of you. Awesome. That is awesome. Angie? The youth, you know I was going to already say that. <laughs> Absolutely. And Heather? Like uh, Ms. Linda said, just everyone here showing up and, and engaging in the conversation. You know, um, I said, let the willing come and he'll do the rest. So if they're Amen. coming, they must be willing and you want to trust in the process. Thank you. I just want to thank uh, the panelists for joining us. Um, your insight and experiences and your passion um, certainly are invaluable. And we are grateful that you were able to join us today. Um, this has been a lively discussion, and I know that this could last so much longer, um, certainly, um, but the recognition, we want to mention that the recognition of Black History Month is not only a respectful acknowledgement of African American history, um, it also is a celebration um, of this rich area of American history. So many African Americans have prevailed Despite a long history of discrimination and oppression, America is better because of the beautiful black culture, creativity, innovation, and documented history. Such deserves to be showcased and celebrated with pride. The Black History Month theme reminds us, and I think we all heard it today, that resistance is something that we can all practice to create. Um, a future that is bright for all people. In fact, to keep having these vital discussions um, are extremely important. Practicing self-care, um, educating ourselves, serving as allies, and ultimately to take action to better the lives of all people, which you've heard from all of the panelists and trailblazers today. I am reminded of one of my favorite advocates for social justice and civil rights, Dr. King, who stated, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. Thank you to the audience for joining us. Just a reminder that um, next Wednesday, February 22nd, will be our final series. Um, we will be celebrating in person um, at 1130 a.m. at the Human Services Building. Thank you again for joining us. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Myla. Thank you all. Great job, Myla. Yep, great job. Thank you, guys. Have Thank you. Great job, time. panelists. Really appreciate you all and your passion. Thank right. you, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.